uh, without further ado, containerizing legacy Windows applications with Docker Enterprise. Uh, myself, my name is Oliver Pomeroy, and I'm part of the solution engineering team here uh, with Docker based in London. So if you've seen any of the previous webinars in this series, uh, you would have seen this slide before. Uh, but just to make sure we're kind of all on the, in, on the same page, um, VMs and containers, they're very different things. Uh, a container uh, is your application code and the binaries and libraries required to run your application packaged together. Uh, once the application's been containerized, it can then run side by side with other applications as multiple containers can be deployed to the same host. All of the isolation of the container uh, is provided via the operating system. So the operating system kernel uh, is the bit that provides isolation. So one application container doesn't know anything about the second application container uh, and so on. So therefore, when you can containerize applications, you can reduce your virtual machine footprint as you start to roll out more applications per host. Uh, containers can run on virtual machines. Uh, obviously, if you're running containers in the cloud, it will probably be running on virtual machines. Uh, but at the same time, containers can also run on physical servers. Uh, we honestly don't mind. Uh, the only dependency we have is on a modern operating system. As a lot of the container technology is done in the kernel, uh, we just need to have a, a modern operating system to support that. So something um, Red Hat 7 or newer, or something like Windows Server 2016 uh, or newer. Once your application has been containerized, though, it can talk out normally out of the host's IP, uh, TCP IP stack. Uh, so if your uh, application wanted to talk to an external database, absolutely fine, can do, no problem. Um, it just talks out of the, the host. The kind of North Star here at Docker, the kind of vision that we have, is really to support any application running on any operating system, uh, running on any infrastructure. Uh, we here at Docker are providing abstracting, abst uh, abstraction, abstracting your application away from the infrastructure that it runs on. Uh, whether your application is a traditional application, a modern cloud-native microservice-based application, or maybe some of the more modern frameworks, something like a serverless or a, a blockchain application, we want to be able to use the Docker platform to kind of abstract all of the different application types, schedule and manage them the same way. Then at the same time, your application is now abstracted away from its infrastructure, giving you the flexibility and the agility to deploy your application wherever you want, whether that's on, on the cloud, whether that's as a virtual machine on premise, whether that's in a bare metal server, or even out there on the edge or an IoT device, uh, we want to use containers to provide that agility for your applications. Uh, the Docker platform itself uh, is built on three core pillars, and, and you would have seen as you've gone through the webinar series, we look in each pillar in a bit more detail, um, but we're, we're providing choice, the ability to, to containerize any application, treat it the same way, and then run that application on any infrastructure. Uh, we're providing agility, the ability for you to, to deploy applications quicker than ever before, um, move applications to the cloud very quickly, or maybe just scale up or scale down applications depending on demand very quickly, all using this concept of a software container. And security is absolutely key to, to us here at Docker, whether that's securely packing up your application as a container or security built into the platforms to make sure that when you deploy that application, it is as secure as possible. Uh, we've gone through the, the common use cases for containers or the common use cases for Docker Enterprise uh, before, but just a quick recap. Um, common use cases for, for containers include modernizing traditional applications, uh, using containers as part of a cloud strategy to migrate applications to the cloud, or to prevent yourselves being locked in when you get there. Uh, people use containers to consolidate infrastructure if they want to start to reduce their virtual machine footprints and therefore reduce hypervisor costs or physical server costs, uh, they can leverage containers. 
uh, customers use containers for faster application deployment and development, uh, often integrating containers into their pipeline tooling. And modernizing that software supply chain by providing um, a simple artifact at every stage of the lifecycle. So you package up your application once and it will be the same in dev, test, UAT, and production. Well, finally, one of the new use cases with containers is helping you deploy software at the edge. Whether that's a, a manufacturing site or an oil rig, uh, we're working hard to make it easier to deploy software containers out there to, to the edge. Uh, in this particular webinar series, uh, we're focusing um, on, on, on more of these cases on the left-hand side, taking legacy applications and containerizing them through um, our MTA program and our MTA technology. At the same time, once you've containerized a legacy application, you're free to move it into the cloud or wherever you'd like, or prevent yourself being locked into that cloud. Um, and you also get to consolidate your infrastructure uh, as a benefit once it's containerized. So let's look at modernizing traditional applications uh, with Docker Enterprise. Uh, if you look at the, the kind of challenges today most enterprises face with their, with their uh, legacy application estate, uh, well, first off, there's, there's kind of a fragile dependency kind of mess or, or dependency soup on, on most of their servers. It's very difficult to patch and maintain um, because worrying that any changes to the operating system might break the framework and then therefore might break the application. And there's quite a, a complex thing to manage there, especially these legacy applications are often untouched and unloved for quite a lot of time. Uh, a traditional legacy application estate, there's often a, a problem around lost knowledge that the original developers or the people that deployed those applications 10, 15 years ago are no longer around or or any of the, the current uh, operations or developer teams are using very different tools to, to what was used on the application originally. Uh, and then at the same time, because Microsoft do quite a good job at, at supporting um, legacy operating systems and legacy frameworks, we're actually finding that a lot of customers are, are just uh, kind of stuck or, or using the stickiness of Windows Server, running their applications today on older versions uh, of, of Windows Server, whether that's 2003 or, or 2008. But we all know today um, that, that Microsoft Windows Server 2008 uh, end of support is coming. Uh, slight error on the slide here, but, but the end of support date for Windows Server 2008 is January 2020, sort of nine months away from, from where we are on this webinar. Therefore, if you want to have a supported operating system from Microsoft, you're gonna to have to pay, pay very large extended support agreement fees or find a way to get your application estate onto a modern host uh, as quickly as possible. Which therefore brings in Docker and the Docker uh, Modernized Traditional Application Program as a way to containerize your legacy applications, move them onto modern hosts. And we can do this all without rewriting or recoding the application um, and then providing both consolidation and infrastructure and future proofing yourself by dropping you onto a, a modern operating system. Uh, so how does this all how does this all work? Well, we're actually able to run legacy frameworks on modern hosts and modern operating systems. On the left hand side, you can see before a Docker MTA program, um, you have free applications running on free virtual machines on Windows Server 2008. A .NET 2 framework application, an IS application, and an ASP uh, net application as well. Now what we're able to do is package up that application and its binary and library as a software container. Um, and then we're able to run that on a new host. We're able to run that old framework on that new host. And one of the key things here is we're actually able to remove all of the uh, Windows Server 2008 components. You are no longer uh, running 2008 anywhere on the right-hand side. We're, we're not uh, emulating it anywhere. You're not packaging up an old kernel or an old host. There will be no kind of Windows Server 2008 components on the right-hand side of this diagram. You just get your application, packaged up as a container, 
running natively on Windows Server 2016 or 2019. This brings across uh, some, some huge benefits. Firstly, we were able to consolidate virtual machine footprint. You can see in this diagram here, we've gone from three um, virtual machines on the left-hand side to one virtual machine on the right. Uh, we've completely removed that legacy operating system. There's, there's no 2008 anywhere. And we're able to migrate these free legacy applications without rewriting them. We haven't had to spend an awful lot of money uh, getting developers to rewrite them to modern frameworks or anything like that. We're able to just lift and shift them onto 2016. Uh, we, we've done this now for, for, uh, for a lot of customers for the past year, 18 months or so, and, and the kind of results kind of speak for themselves. Whether that's consolidating infrastructure, both at the virtual machine footprint, at the operating system license level, or maybe even the operation support savings, the fact that you no longer have to patch and maintain um, this wide variety of virtual machine operating systems and the number of hosts. And then you're also now getting to take advantage of all of the productivity gains that come with containers. The speed to deploy, the agility, um, the, the idea to secure your applications inside of that container, that you kind of are, are, are benefits of using the Docker approach um, that you kind of don't even realize for your legacy applications, but they now get to be treated and get to be, have the advantages of more modern cloud native applications. So let's have a look at, at Windows containers and, and the state of Windows containers here in, uh, in April 2019. So Windows containers have been around now uh, for, for quite a long time. Uh, when Microsoft announced the general availability of Windows Server 2016, uh, back in October or September 2016, um, we had Docker support from, from day one. We had the ability to now schedule Windows containers the same way that we've been able to schedule Linux containers for 20 odd years. Uh, today, how can you consume Windows containers? Well, you can consume Windows containers uh, over two methods. If you're a developer or for your developers, all you need is a Windows 10 workstation and either Docker Desktop or Docker Desktop Enterprise. Docker Desktop or Docker Desktop Enterprise provide the ability to take advantage of your local Windows 10 machine and the local Windows 10 kernel to create Windows containers for you. You don't need anything else, just download Docker Desktop and Docker Desktop Enterprise and you're good to go. Uh, unfortunately, if you're a Linux or a Mac user on your workstation, you, you need to find yourself at a Windows machine somewhere. Um, because we're not emulating a kernel, you, you can't containerize Windows applications if you, if you don't have a Windows kernel. Uh, for an operator, uh, the only thing you need to take advantage of Windows containers uh, is the Docker engine or the Docker Enterprise engine. Uh, this is available for both Windows Server 2016 and Server 2019, and it's actually free of charge included inside of the cost of a Windows Server license. So anybody today with a Windows Server 2016 or 2019 license can take advantage of uh, Windows containers using the Docker Enterprise Engine. So how does this actually work or kind of what, what's under the hood? So you pull down uh, the Docker Enterprise Engine, which is the container runtime component uh, that runs as a, as a Windows service. And then all we need to do is every time you want to deploy a Windows container, we will just spin up a container image alongside. The, the Docker engine is not in between the application and the kernel, so there isn't an overhead when running an application in a container. It's running natively on the host there. And then when you want to start to deploy more and more applications, you're sharing that same kernel, but you're providing that isolated environment for each application to run. So each Windows Server container doesn't know about the other one, uh, but the host knows about both of them. Uh, if some of you security guys out there are getting a little bit twitchy about kind of sharing a, a kernel, uh, out of the box inside of uh, Windows, you have uh, this idea of, of a Hyper-V hypervisor. And we can leverage the Hyper-V hypervisor to provide Hyper-V isolation for Windows containers. So when you bring up a container, instead of bringing up a container natively on the host, like you can see on the left-hand side or in the middle of the diagram rather, 
you actually bring up a container that's packaged the same way. You don't have to do anything different, but with its own kernel and its own very, very lightweight operating system managed via Windows Server. So you don't have to worry about this little lightweight bit in the corner. That's all managed to you via Docker and Windows Server. But that application container, that legacy framework, that something that you've now dropped out in the cloud is now actually isolated with its own kernel. So you, you still actually have quite a secure zone um, if, if you're that way, uh, you need to do that for whatever reason. Uh, as we've gone through the Windows journey, so we're, we're kind of now um, three and a half years into the Windows container journey, uh, every time there's a new release, we've, we've got a host of new features that come up with us. Um, so right back from, from October 2016, as we've iterated all the way up to, to Windows Server 2019 that came out in, in October last year, uh, we've seen huge improvements in, in Windows container support, whether that's on the size of container images that have uh, gone a lot more and more, uh, a lot smaller throughout the generations, or whether that's enhancements around their storage or their networking stack for Windows containers as we start to get feature parity between Windows and Linux containers. One of the, the big questions that come out, well, I use Windows containers, but how, how do I integrate them today inside of my Active Directory environment? All of my legacy applications or existing applications today use uh, Active Directory authentication. Uh, how do I pass that into something that's so short-lived or so dynamic as a container? Well, well the first thing uh, to say is containers are not joined to an Active Directory domain. The container host is. And then what we actually do is we pass this, this idea of a credential spec into a container. And that is, is kind of the only bits and pieces we need for a containerized application to talk to Active Directory or talk to external components using the identity passed in in a credential spec. Uh, credential specs here are actually leveraging group managed service accounts. So it's kind of a service account that you're passing into your application container and it's using that service account to authenticate itself to external components like databases or, uh, or, or any other component in your application. Uh, the only thing you need to do to, to uh, um, support uh, GMSAs or group managed service accounts inside of your environment is have one Active Directory 2012 domain controller running somewhere. Um, at that point, you have one of those running, you can take advantage of GMSAs, you can containerize legacy applications with Windows authentication. Okay, so we've had a look at introducing Windows containers, we've, we've seen how you can use Windows containers natively or Windows containers with Hyper-V. But, but one of the next questions that come up is, is how do I use Windows containers uh, with container orchestration? Uh, there's quite a lot of container orchestrators out there in the market today. Um, for here in Docker, we, we inside of Docker Enterprise, we have native support for both Docker Swarm and native support for Kubernetes. We honestly don't mind which one of those two orchestrators you use to schedule your application containers. Uh, orchestrators give you some, some, some big benefits when you start to roll out multiple applications in containers and start to roll out those multiple applications across multiple hosts. Uh, container orchestrators give you the ability for resource management. They are that scheduling component and uh, container orchestrators know through their service management parts which application is running where. So you no longer have to maintain these big spreadsheets to try and understand, well, that container is running on that host or anything like that. Uh, all that is taken care of for you via Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. Now, when you look at Windows containers and Windows containers with an orchestrator, um, there are kind of uh, the, the two clear runners here around Swarm and Kubernetes, and one slightly more mature um, than the other. On the Docker Swarm side, we've had support for Windows containers uh, since, since launch, since October 2016. Um, and we've had support inside of Docker Enterprise, our, our, our commercial product, since April 2017. 
So we've now got a, a few years under our belts of sort of deploying and managing Windows containers and, and running legacy applications in Windows containers. Uh, we have full support um, on uh, the various different operating system releases from 2016 all the way up to 2019, including those new semi-annual channels. And Docker Swarm nodes can, can be managers, can be workers inside of your environment, and then at the same time, if your environment had Linux and Windows workers, they could run side by side on, on different virtual machines, but join to the same cluster. The same Docker Swarm environment can schedule Windows and Linux containers uh, uh, happily. Uh, Docker, support, uh, Docker, support, Docker Swarm has full support for Hyper-V containers, as well as support for things like secrets, configuration maps, uh, and volumes. And Docker Swarm also has full, full support now uh, for GMSAs. Uh, on the Kubernetes side, um, Kubernetes is recently new to the Windows container game. Uh, they've been generally available now for, for just about a month, or not quite a month. Uh, the, the Kubernetes 114 release brought in general availability of Windows containers inside of Kubernetes. However, the Kubernetes distributions, like our own inside of Docker Enterprise, uh, plan to pick up support for Windows containers uh, in the second half of this year. So in the second half of this year, you can choose whether to schedule containers via Swarm or Kubernetes. Uh, today, you would schedule your Windows containers via Swarm. Uh, on the Kubernetes side, they only support 2019, they don't support 2016 and you have to run your Kubernetes control plane on Linux. Uh, you can't run it on Windows. A few other things to bear in mind is, is Kubernetes has experimental support for those Hyper-V isolated containers. Uh, one of the fundamental things inside of Kubernetes are pods. Pods are one or more containers grouped together. Uh, you actually can't support the more containers bit on, on Hyper-V today. And then finally, that, that authentication piece brought in by GMSAs uh, today is, is alpha. It is pretty early on uh, in experimental in the Kubernetes world. So we expect that to mature a little bit uh, as we kind of go through the year. But one of the key things here from, from Docker and from Docker Enterprise's point of view is we honestly don't mind which orchestrator you use to schedule your containers. We've even um, spent time working on Docker Compose and using Docker Compose to abstract your applications away from the orchestrator. So you can containerize your application once and that will work no matter you're, you're using it on Swarm or Kubernetes. And then you can define your application once inside of a Docker Compose file. And once again, that will be completely agnostic whether you're scheduling that application uh, on Swarm or Kubernetes, we honestly don't mind. So here inside of Docker, uh, we're helping you abstract your application away, not only from its infrastructure, uh, but from uh, the container orchestrator as well. Okay. Uh, so let's look at now getting started containerizing legacy applications. Uh, if you look at a, a common, applica uh, common uh, application estate, you normally find there are a couple of different architectures of applications that you see time and time again. And if I had to try and summarize or, or group these, uh, what you would find is that there are uh, loads of three tier applications, loads of two tier applications, and then some competing consumers. So, so uh, kind of a three tier application would have a web layer, have an application layer, and an external database. Uh, two tier, you often find the web and the application tiers kind of joined together on the same host or part of the same service, and then a backend database, and then a competing consumer where you would have some sort of message queue, some message bus, and then various .NET components of your application, once again, talking out to a external SQL server. So when you want to start to containerize your applications, um, there is a whole host of things that you can support in the containers. But uh, we here in Docker kind of think that it makes sense to, to pick a few applications to begin with, containerize a few legacy applications as you start to familiarize yourselves with Windows containers and has, uh, how your expertise around Windows containers grows uh, before you start to go into the uh, kind of the app batteries or the, the big wide world of, of, of any application we kind of 
say narrow the scope a little bit, pick some some friendlier application architectures like a free tier or a two tier or a, a competing consumer application, containerize there, understand Docker a bit more, and then go after some of the wider application estates. Um, so when you're picking those first few legacy applications to go after, um, what what are some things that that uh, we can kind of learn from our experience so far? Well, when picking legacy applications to containerize, um, there's, there's kind of a few things to bear in mind. On the architecture perspective, you're really containerizing applications in the .NET framework family uh, or in the Java family. Those applications are normally two free tier applications, but don't worry, we don't have to containerize the whole thing. Uh, containers can absolutely talk to external components. So if, if you pick like a, a free tier or a two tier application, then you could containerize the web tier and the application tier and do the database uh, as you would a normal traditional database migration, or maybe leave the database where it is. Or you may want to containerize uh, the .NET components inside of a competing consumer but you wanted to leave the message queue where it was. And that's absolutely fine as well. You can absolutely mix and match the components you containerize inside of your application. Um, on the runtime side, uh, on the .NET, we would, we would look to run anything newer than .NET Framework 2.0. The, the more newer frameworks are a little bit easier to containerize, but we can go all the way back to, to 2.0. Um, and we can also include things like IAS, so Internet Information Services. Um, we can containerize IAS applications running IAS 6 or newer as well. Uh, those can be containerized alongside ASP.NET applications as well. Uh, on the Java side, we can, we can containerize some of the, the, the traditional um, Java frameworks and, and web server frameworks on the Java side, like Tomcat or WebLogic uh, or WebSphere. And we can even containerize JBoss applications as well. When you're trying to work out which legacy applications to go after, um, on the dependency side, one of the, the key things to make sure that you have available to you uh, is things like the deployment artifacts or the source code. When you containerize an application, what you're actually doing is either lifting and shifting the application code into a container or installing the application again inside of a container's file system. Um, so we may need things like the installation media uh, and the deployment artifacts again. When picking those first few candidates for containerization, it's good to be really familiar with the application as you're starting to learn the Docker components. So making sure that the app owner is on board, there's a subject matter expert for the application and, and some good installation documentation to containerize that application. When we containerize the first few applications, we, we don't normally containerize the database components. And I'll, I'll talk more about SQL Server in a moment. Um, but we're normally actually just containerizing the, the web tiers, the application tiers, maybe the message bus tiers uh, inside of your application. Normally, containerizing the databases are out of scope for, for, for at the start of Docker projects. And make sure you consider the Active Directory requirements as well kind of what service accounts need to be created, what, what permissions do those service accounts need uh, when you start to run your containerized applications in containers. Finally, uh, on the implementation side, uh, make sure that there's kind of no hard-coded IPs or host names inside of the app application. When you deploy legacy applications in containers, things like networking is a lot more fluid, um, so kind of bear that in mind. And also the question around, does the deployment support unintended installations? Um, you won't have a user interface. You won't have uh, the option to RDP into a container. Um, so you're not going to be able to click next, next, next on a, on a, on a GUI, on a UI. Uh, you need to have unattended or silent installations of your application uh, for them to run inside of a container. One of the, the, the more common questions that come up here is, well, can I containerize COTS applications? Can I containerize off-the-shelf applications? And uh, the first question that often gets asked is, well, what's the relationship with the vendor like, or, or what's the kind of uh, T's and C's with that application? For example, 
would we break support by running that application in a container? Or would we break support by running that legacy application on 2016 or 2019? That's kind of the first question. And, and sometimes uh, the vendors are happy to engage and talk around that. Other times uh, the actual applications are out of support. So running them in a container isn't a problem themselves. Uh, you also need to bear in mind the licensing consideration as well. We don't want to break any licensing um, or EULAs or anything like that when running the application in a container image. And right now as well, actually, many of the ISVs are providing certified images of themselves, uh, of their applications themselves, um, publicized normally on the Docker Hub. So today we have people like Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, SAP, all releasing containerized versions of their application that you can just consume. You don't have to worry about uh, containerizing, uh, I don't know, WAS yourself. You could go and take the WebSphere application server uh, straight from the Docker Hub. Uh, containerizing SQL Server. So I did mention as part of a, a, a legacy application project, we do not containerize the SQL Server components. Um, the, the reason for that uh, is, is because the, the SQL Server container images that are produced by Microsoft for both Linux and Windows um, are full fat SQL Server instances, however, primarily used for development and testing. Uh, understanding how to deploy SQL Server in high available deployments and, and understanding the persistent storage element of SQL Server is kind of still going through uh, the kind of best practices are still emerging and maturing. Uh, today, as part of legacy application projects, we only containerize uh, the web tiers and the application tiers. Um, now, one of the, the questions that often come up is, is, is how can Docker help? in automating the process to containerize your application. Uh, Docker have, have, had a first generation tool called Image Docker, which can help you containerize Windows applications. Uh, we now have a, a, a new tool uh, for this called the Docker Application Converter. When using Docker's services or any of our certified partners and systems integrators, uh, they will have access to DAC, the Docker Application Converter tool. Uh, DAC runs on a legacy virtual machine and using its pluggable detectors of things like IIS or Tomcat or, or, or WebSphere, we were able to identify the application and containerize the legacy application for you. You'll basically create a Docker file, um, which will define what that application looks like in a container and containerize the application um, for you. DAC is available as part of any Docker services engagement or as part of any of our certified partners. So an awful lot of slides there, but let, let's jump straight into a demonstration around understanding how all of this works in practice, how we can take a legacy application uh, and containerize it. So um, let's jump to a Windows Server virtual machine. So here I have on my um, remote desktop an old, make sure it's not timed out. It looks like it may have done. Try again. One second, looks like it timed out, but it's back. Okay. Um, we now have an old Windows Server 2008 uh, uh, virtual machine. That virtual machine is running a jobs application on IIS. So this is a, an old version of IIS Manager, as you can see, and we've got ourselves a legacy jobs application. Now this is a two-tiered application. So the application has a, a wonderful user interface that you can see here, and it's connected behind the scenes to a, a database component. Database component is running on a, on a separate virtual machine. So what we want to do is we want to be able to lift and shift this application. I don't want to rewrite it to a newer framework. I, I don't want to, to try and understand the application. I just want to lift and shift it as quick as possible so I can remove 2008 from my environment. Well, the first thing I've done here is I've preloaded the DAC tool. Now, um, the DAC tool is now running uh, here. So if, 
look inside of my uh, directory, you will see I have DAC sat here, ready to go. Now DAC is our application converter tool. Um, and this is a, a kind of a, a binary that we can use to containerize. I'm just going to use the DAC discover here to um, have a look inside of my environment. I'm going to do a DAC discover, and then I'm going to tell it which file system to use. So I'm going to use uh, DAC discover and the C drive. Off it goes. Um, first thing it comes back is that, okay, do you want to uh, look through the server and containerize each application we find individually? Or do you want to try and group as many applications as you can together? Uh, I, I just want to do one container per application. So just a standard DAC mode will work for me. Ooh, I didn't run this in a privileged prompt. Give me one second. Switch to a privileged prompt. And switch back to the right directory. And we'll go again. That discover, and off we go. So what is now done for me is it's gone through my server. It said, okay, you're running on 2008. DAC said, I'm, I'm going to look for Tomcat, IS, WebSphere, and WebLogic containers for you, uh, applications for you, rather. It's gone through and looked in the traditional places where those applications live. And it said, okay, well, I found two applications running on, on, on this server, the default website and the job application that we looked at before. Do you want to containerize any of those? Yes, I do. Uh, which one do I want to containerize? I want to do IIS1, job, jobs. And off I go. So what that would have done for me is it would have had a look and identified um, what, what kind of version of IES that I'm running, where the application actually lives on the host. And it would have copied all of that to a nice directory for me. And it also would have built out a Docker file. So if I cd to that directory, One. You can see that I now have my application called jobs and I have a Docker file all containerized or grouped together. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually build the container image on this host. Windows Server 2008 does not have the underlying technology to support containers. Uh, so it can't build the application here, but it's identified where the what the application looks like, the source code, and a Docker file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just that bit and move it across to a uh, new host. So jump out of there and reconnect to a 2019 server. Great. And now on this new 2019 server, I'm going to containerize my application. This is just a, a Windows Server 2019 box um, that I'm going to use to build my containerized application. A quick look uh, inside of here. Um, let's have a look. Just, uh, look, you can see that inside of jobs, uh, I have the application source code on from the other server and the Docker file. The Docker file would have automatically been written via DAC to Docker's best practices. So just me opening up that now, you can kind of see uh, what we've done is we're going to start from um, the, the uh, ASP.NET image. We're going to remove the default IIS site. We're going to install some features and then copy across my application code. First thing I, I need to do on 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 uh, on my side, I'll quickly set some variables, um, is build that application into a container. We know to build an application in a container, all you need to do is do Docker image build, and point it to a directory where the Docker file lives. A quick run of that command will build that application in a container locally. 
right now that you can see that we've built the application. It was quick because uh, it was all kind of cached, um, but it's built a container image for me uh, called this. I can now run my legacy application natively here on Windows Server. Uh, I'm literally going to do a Docker container run and start up that application in a container. Oh, right. I now see an error. So what's just happened is I've started up an application in a container. If I, if I do something like a Docker container list, uh, you can see that I have my application started 18 seconds ago, um, which is, is my legacy application. However, when I open up Chrome and browse to my, my, my container, I see an error. That's because I haven't got my Active Directory authentication sorted. I've only containerized the application. I haven't generated my service account or my service account spec. Now, fortunately, this is a demonstration. So we've already gone to our Active Directory guys and they've created a service account for us. Um, so I can, I can quickly um, create a credential spec off that service account. Quickly do that and create a new credential spec. And if you are curious to see what a credential spec actually looks like, um, down. Uh, the credential spec right now is, as you can see, it's just a bit of JSON, but it just gives a name of my uh, service account, which is Job CMSA, and the various scopes that they have inside of my environment. Um, what I need to do now is I'm going to restart my container. So stop the previous one, restart it again, um, but this time I'm going to pass in. You can see, pass in a credential spec file. Grab all of this good stuff and rerun it. Whoop. Perfect. Uh, it's now coming starting up, and we're now hopefully going through all the IIS processes. Excellent. We now have my application running. It's running locally on my Windows Server 2019 virtual machine. So what I've just done is I've taken an application from 2008. I've run DAC to identify the application code and the framework that it's running on. I've then brought my application code and a pre-built Docker file to 2019, built it locally, and then passed in a service account so that the same application can talk to the previous backend. But the backend hasn't changed between these two application tiers. However, one's running on 2008 and it's about to go end of support. Uh, the, this one running on 2019, and I'm good to go now for for a long, long time. OK, so that was a bit of a demonstration. Uh, just to kind of finish off the, the presentation here, um, all of that is exposed and part of the Docker Enterprise Container Platform that we've talked about in this webinar and previous webinars. The Enterprise Container Platform includes both our desktop products around Docker Desktop Enterprise that enables developers to containerize their application locally. It includes the Docker Trusted Registry, a form in which we can share our containerized applications. Uh, and it includes the Universal Control Plane, a place to securely run your application via Swarm or Kubernetes inside of the data center or the cloud. All three of those components are packaged up inside of Docker Enterprise. And in the latest Forrester Wave, you can clearly see here that Docker's enterprise platform uh, is leading the way in enterprise container platform software. Well, that's it. Thank you. And, and thank you for watching the webinar series. Um, we've kind of gone through all of our presentation content, and now the team will handle uh, some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. We will now open things up for Q&A, as Oliver said. We have Stephen Fallis online, Docker Solutions Engineer, and he is here on hand to take your questions. So if you haven't already, please post your questions in that questions panel. Uh, Stephen, have you had a chance? Are you looking through? you see any questions that you can share with us now? 
I sure have. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Oliver, Oliver for being with us today. Um, so a couple questions that I want to kind of touch on that came out of the Q&A during this session was uh, really around the different types of applications that are really appropriate for containerization. And so just wanted to kind of call out that when we're talking about containerizing applications, be them Windows, Windows-based apps or Linux-based apps, these are typically headless or server side applications. So not things that are desktop client-based. So not uh, WPF, Windows Forms, Silverlight, things that require a desktop context to be able to run. Um, that said, for a lot of solutions, we often see where there's a client-server relationship. So you've got an older WinForms application that talks to a back-end um, server-side application. We can oftentimes containerize half of that solution, the, the server-side pieces, and then users can then use their same client. They're just talking to a containerized back-end. So that was one of the pieces I wanted to, to comment on. Um, also, from a different from the types of applications, we're also looking at those that um, are, are typically not the the largest, most complex applications out there. So we often get questions around, hey, can I go containerize all of SharePoint, uh, or all of SAP, or all of PeopleSoft, or these these very large, complex apps? Uh, and so oftentimes, uh, there's a, a technical reality of can we get them to run in a container? Most of the time, yes, or we can at least get close. Uh, but oftentimes, we're running into a, a, um, licensing considerations as well. So for enterprise software uh, that are coming from third parties or, or consumer off-the-shelf sh off software, there's oftentimes supported configurations for those applications. And so sometimes they say, hey, it doesn't really matter how you deploy. Other times they say it must be on bare metal or a virtual machine. So license considerations always come into play when we talk about containerizing uh, different kinds of applications. Oftentimes, these are much uh, more relaxed for non-production environments. So if I'm looking to stand up a, a developer environment of a particular application suite, um, oftentimes we can containerize the application, have it up and running, and while it may not be supported for full production use, at least as a developer or as, in a, as a non-production user, I can get a, an instance of that environment up and running in a very easy way with containers. Uh, one of the other kind of topics that often comes up is around, hey, I, you know, I'm developing on a, a Windows-based machine, either Windows 10 or Windows Server 2016, uh, but I want to work with with Linux containers. And so, uh, typically, we we have a one-to-one -one mapping where a Linux container runs on top of a uh, on a, a t on top of a Windows Server environment, Windows container to Windows Server host, and likewise a Linux container on top of a Linux server. Um, however, there is a feature inside of Docker Desktop that we call Linux Containers on Windows, or LCAL. And so what LCAL allows us to do is, is as a development tool, it allows someone that's developing on a Windows environment to actually run Linux-based containers. So we get we can kind of get around that one-to-one -one mapping for development workloads. This is not a tool that's sp really specific to production workloads, but as a developer, if I want to work on a Node.js-based application or Java or Python, something in a Linux container, I can run that on my desktop with, with Docker Desktop. So that gives some developer flexibility uh, that we can see. Um, as far as uh, some Windows-specific things inside of containers, uh, so we have the entire Windows registry that is available inside of containers. So if your application needs to set or interact with registry properties, we can do that inside of the container by setting those inside of the Docker file. Uh, the Windows event log is available inside of the container. So you, if your application is writing into the event log, uh, we can pull logs out of that container to see uh, what that application is logging. And so that's also um, something that we have available inside of the container. Uh, so I'm seeing some other con some questions rolling in. Um, I want to get some information around. Let me have just a moment to read through some of these. Uh, so for se security concerns. So when it comes to uh, the questions around kind of older versions of IIS. So, so when we containerize an IIS-based application, we're actually taking the application that's running today in an older version of IIS, an IIS 6 or 7 type environment, and we actually decouple that application from the underlying operating system and that underlying uh, web server. So we take the application away, and when we containerize it, it's running essentially on top of a Windows Server 2016 or 2019 environment on top of a modern version of IIS. So we're actually not bringing forward old, outdated web servers. We're actually able to use uh, more modern-based environments for that application. So we can get around some of the security vulnerabilities or some of the security pieces that we have there. Um, so from a, let's see what else we have here. 
so, so the, da the Docker application converter is is part of the Docker Enterprise platform, and so it's it's used by our customers that have a, a Docker Enterprise license. Part of that license is the ability to gain access to that Docker application converter. It's part of our, our broad suite of, of 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 components there. So starting from Docker Desktop all the way to our Universal Control Plane, Docker Trusted Registry, Docker you know, Docker application converter is part of that Docker Enterprise family that's there. Um, so from a maturity perspective with LCAL, uh, this is another area where, you know, it's very mature from a dev perspective, uh, but even Microsoft, you know, this is an area that we, we co-develop with Microsoft. It's an area where even Microsoft has really kind of said this is more of a dev type tool, not really intended for production type workloads. There's still, uh, you know, some performance considerations that are kind of blocking uh, the ability to go run that in, in kind of a production environment there. Um, so we have some questions, you know, really where's the best place to get started with Docker technology? Uh, the, the good part about Docker is really just the, the wonderful massive community that we have around this technology. And so if you're looking to get started, if you have a subscription to things like Pluralsight or Lynda, uh, those can be some, some great platforms for learning that you may have access to already. Uh, we talk with many customers that have site licenses for some of those tooling and they have some great Docker content on there. Uh, when it when it comes to Windows containers specifically, my colleague Elton Stoneman is uh, one of our evangelists here at Docker that's done you know immense uh, amounts of work in the community with blog posts. Uh, he's written an entire book around Windows containers that I would highly recommend. Again, his name is Elton Stoneman. You can find his book on on Amazon and some of his courses on Pluralsight and otherwise. Um, a wide number of blogs, tutorials. Uh, we have a site called Play with Docker that does a really nice job of interactively teaching you Docker basics. Uh, we have a variety of a Docker samples repository on GitHub that have, you know, full applications with the app and the Docker files, so you can see how those applications were containerized. Uh, some some great working samples there, both Linux and Windows based. Uh, we have a whole labs um, um, repository on side of GitHub as well that walks through kind of step by step how to do different containerization activities, including a large number of activities specific to Windows. So things like uh, SQL Server and containers. There's an entire lab there on how to use uh, DAC packs and backpacks to be able to d programmatically deploy schema and sample data into Windows containers out of Visual Studio. So um, a lot of very uh, a lot of resources out there, both free and premium content uh, to get started. And I think the, the best thing is just you know, pick an application you've got, start containerizing it. Then as you grow and mature, you can grow into you know, needing more of a clustered environment, needing a, you know, an enterprise grade registry, more of those components. Uh, the great part with, with Docker is that we can start with Docker Community Edition, our, our free tier, then move into Docker Enterprise when it comes time to operationalize that work that you've been doing around containers and for those applications. Um, so let me see another question. If an app is migrated into a container and has vulnerabilities, does it have the same vulnerabilities in the container? Uh, generally, yes. Uh, so if you're taking an application that's 10 years old that has a, a large number of known vulnerabilities, uh, moving that into a container is not going to just magically solve all of those out-of-date libraries or frameworks or packages that are inside of that container. Uh, what it will do is uh, provide a, a more secure way to operate that and that we don't have a whole guest operating system for any kind of malicious code to break out into uh, because that container runs in, a, in that secure kind of envelope where it has limited resources there. Um, and so as you containerize, um, one of the things that our Docker Trusted Registry is, is known for is being able to do security scanning. And so we can go detect a lot of these packages that are old and outdated. Um, when it comes to legacy applications, though, uh, there's only so much we can do. If there's a, a DLL or a, a component that you have in your application and, you know, the original team or the original company that created that is, is gone and, uh, or you're running on an older version of, uh, of .NET in your code that's no longer supported, we can't magically fix those things. But we can give a, a more secure way to run that outdated code inside of a container there. Um, so good, and let me see. Um, so a question here around, does DAC containerize the application code or does it containerize IIS? So, okay, so, so DAC is really after uh, building a Docker file for that app. And so IIS will be inside of the Docker file, inside of that base image. Um, what DAC is going to do is grab the application code and all the configuration to build that Docker file. And so within the Docker file itself, we'll base that on an image that has IIS. We'll then layer on the application code that DAC pulled out. We'll layer in the configuration that DAC discovered uh, and then be able to run that application. So we're not pulling out IIS, you know, IIS 7 with DAC. Instead, we take the application code and then run it in a container with a, with a modern version of IIS, modern version 
um, of .NET there as well. So with that, I want to appreciate all the great questions and interactions today. Really appreciate um, all of y'all being here and, and being so engaged. And with that, Melanie, uh, I think I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you, everyone, for your great questions and, and being so interactive today. This does conclude our webinar. Um, just a reminder that today's session was recorded, and you'll receive a follow-up email to view this recording in the next few days. We thank you again for joining us and hope to see you on future Docker webinars. We thank you again and hope you have a great day.